If you are pregnant or you've recently had a baby, this podcast is for you. I am your host, Kath Bequee, a physiotherapist working in women's health and mum of three. Join me each week as we dive into all things pregnancy care, childbirth and postnatal recovery, helping you have a wonderful pregnancy and afterbirth experience. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. Well, hello there. It's great to have you here for another episode of the Fitness Mama podcast. In this episode today, I am chatting with baby sleep consultant Jazz Kostov. So Jazz is a sleep consultant, midwife, maternal child health nurse, and a mother. And we discussed in today's episode some amazing tips for pregnant and new mums. Sleep is a big topic. It's one that I think as soon as you're a parent, everyone's asking, how's your baby sleeping? Are they sleeping through the night? And I know from personal experience, it can also be an area that's very much an unknown. It it can, you know, but everyone who is sleep deprived knows how challenging it can be. So in this episode today, it's so great to chat to Jazz because we talk about newborn sleep. Jazz gives some great tips to help your newborn get to sleep, the environment and the sleep environment, talk about creating, and and I say this in air quotation marks, bad habits in in terms of rocking and feeding to sleep. So we discuss all the things. It's a a relatively short episode, but it is value packed. And I wish I had listened to this episode before the birth of my first baby, which was a long time ago now before podcasts were even around. So do stick around because I trust you are going to get a lot of value from today's episode, especially if you're pregnant and you're about to have a baby or you have a baby in those first three months. First of all, though, I am super excited to invite you to join Fitness Mama. So if you have found you're not exercising as much as you'd like to during pregnancy and post-pregnancy, perhaps you're busy or you've lost some motivation to exercise, or you're not sure how to best be looking after your body, or you've got pelvic girdle pain and abdominal muscle separation and you're not sure about the best exercises for you. Or perhaps you want to get back into running after birth and you want the best Kickstarter possible. Then Fitness Mama is for you. Join us for these convenient, short, easy workouts that you can do from the comfort of your home whilst your baby sleeps, whilst your toddler is running around causing havoc, or at the end of a long day at work. So simply head to fitnessmama.com and the link is also in the show notes. Right, let's get into this episode. Jazz, thank you so much for joining me today on the Fitness Mama podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So it's so exciting to chat because baby sleep is huge. And I remember it distinctly being stressful, especially for first baby. But then you think you got it all sorted and they change and they grow and something new happens. And then you have a second baby and they're totally different and something changes again. So it's one of those ever evolving situations. So we are going to try to condense this into the first zero to three months, because I know it's a massive topic that we could talk about forever. Forever. (laughs) (laughs) So to start off with Jazz, could you please quickly introduce yourself and what brought you to become a baby sleep consultant? Yeah, so my name's Jazz. I'm based on the Mornington Peninsula just outside of Melbourne. My background is in midwifery and maternal and child health nursing and general nursing, so quite a medical background and developed a real passion and love for baby sleep and helping parents with it through my maternal and child health roles. So I did some extra study to become a sleep consultant. And now I run my own business and have done for a couple of years. And I just love it. I love being able to help parents in the way that they need with no kind of restrictions or, you know, no things to think about in terms of policy. I just love that, giving parents what they need in the moment. And maternal child health nurses, they're fantastic, but they've also only got a small amount of time. So, and they have to do 
everything in the appointment, like check the baby and <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah, great yeah. you've got that background. Yeah, it is. And I've sort of got that experience and I, I still work casually as a midwife and I just adore working as a midwife. But yeah, I, I definitely have found my passion working with parents on sleep and I support families with babies from birth right through to five years. So very different ends of the range, working with newborns right through to toddlers and, and older kids, which I love the variety. Amazing. So I will link all your details in the show notes, but let's get started at the start. So let's say a mum or family have a newborn baby. When it comes to sleep, what, where do we start? Yeah, so this, this is actually a big reason why I went and studied this because I just realised that families were having their bubs in hospital And we were sending them home with very little information on sleep and where to start. And something as basic as just understanding roughly how long your baby would be awake for before you offer them another sleep or offer them a nap is a really good place to start. And it sounds so basic. and You would have heard that before, I'm sure, if you're a parent. But awake times, just rough, rough sort of awake windows I like to talk about. And it is just really helpful so that we can prevent that overtiredness and just make settling a lot easier. So, you know, I have the, I can link you to a table with the rough times, but for a newborn, a fresh newborn in the first few weeks, it's, you know, very short, 45 to 60 minutes of awake time. Ideally, they'd be back asleep by an hour of awake time. So it's really short by the time you offer a feed, have a bit of a cuddle, do a nappy change or two if there's been a few bowel motions in that hour and then back to sleep again. It goes very quickly. So yeah, definitely awake times is is where I'd be starting. And then moving on to moving on to your sleep environment, I'd be looking at making sure that you're not putting too much emphasis on your baby sleeping, you know, in their cot or in their bassinet um, in that newborn phase. Just go with the path of least resistance. Our little ones are unpredictable, you know, by nature, and sometimes they they really struggle to settle in their cot. So I think focusing on, you know, maybe a carrier walk or pram nap or something like that, you know, doing a few of those in the day is totally fine. I think. You know, something I see a lot is parents really struggling with feeling like they have to offer naps in cots and putting a lot of pressure on. And you just don't need to do that. It's totally fine to offer some assisted naps, especially, you know, our little ones are so used to being, you know, in our tummies right against our heartbeat and feeling our motion and our nice warm skin. And, you know, it's it's really obvious that that that's what they love in that in that newborn phase so enjoy that you know contact naps pram naps are so fine and just yeah not putting too much pressure on yourself yeah I love the fact that you say that because I distinctly remember feeling like I had to get them to sleep in the cot especially my first baby and I I totally remember that very much a self-assigned pressure I I don't feel like anyone's yeah it's yeah, I can't, no no one applied the pressure to me, but I applied it to myself, I felt. So that's really nice to hear you say that. I think as well, you know, obviously I'm on Instagram and I share information and I know there's so many other sources of information online. And I think sometimes maybe parents see that, you know, we, we're looking at routine and self-settling and all of these things, but, and they kind of think that that's also relevant for newborns and it's, it's not, you know, newborns take time to actually figure out what's day, what's night, you know, their circadian rhythms, which is their concept of day and night, that doesn't actually become fully established until, you know, closer to that eight to 10 weeks of age. And that's when you start to see babies really wake up, and be a lot more wakeful, sometimes a little bit more challenging to settle. So, you know, a, probably a really good tip to, for parents with fresh, fresh newborns from about three weeks of age, I do recommend when you're home for nap time, offering a really dark room for sleep, just to start, you know, helping their natural body systems understand that that's nap time. Reducing stimulation is a huge one. Obviously, if the room's light, they can see everything. So if they fall asleep, 
and then half an hour they wake up and they look around the room, it's it's nice and bright. They're just a lot more likely to be fully awake at that yeah. point and not want to go back to sleep, which it makes sense. You think about, you know, when you have a nap during the day, you're probably going to turn the lights off and draw the blind. It's, it's quite basic. And, and even now, my four-year-old, I swear, as soon as there is a sliver of light in that blind, <laughs> five o'clock, she's up. And there's yeah. no holding her back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, like my my friends and my family have laughed at me about how focused I am on a dark room, but it is really important. It, it, it so is that it really does help them sleep a lot better. That doesn't mean that your baby will only sleep in a dark room. You know, obviously when you're out doing a carrier walk or a, a car nap or a pram nap, it's going to be lighter than what it would be at home. And that's totally fine. Because when you're having a nap in those environments, you've got the gift of motion, which the white is really noise. rhythmic. Yeah, that yeah. portable white noise. I'm a huge fan of that too. You know, you can either play that on your phone or just buy a cheap portable, you know, device yeah. to use. Yeah. But I mean, even the white noise, maybe it's not called white noise, but you know, the engine running in the car, just those yeah. sorts of noises and the car, the pram, the wheels and like noisy wheels, like that's all just. Yeah, the movement yeah. and the noise. Yeah. Even just your rhythmic steps on the footpath, you know, all of that kind of stuff is is really relaxing for them at sleep time. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, so I think they're the main things um, I'd talk about. The biggest thing is just having realistic expectations. You know, as I said, newborns are unpredictable by nature. And I think if you have this perception or in your head, you're like, you know, I want them to have all their their naps in their cot and they're going to be two hour naps. And, you know, setting that bar so high can really, it can really be challenging for parents when babies don't settle as they thought they would, or it just looks quite different to how they thought. So just normalizing that, I think, which is, is a really good place to start. So I know we weren't going to talk about older babies as such, but if you're saying, you know, let them sleep anywhere just in the first three months, like just take the pressure off yourself. At what mm-hmm. stage would you say, okay, this is becoming something we need to focus on and maybe they do need to have a designated yeah. cot sleep? Like a, where, when do you, when does that yeah. switch happen? Yeah, that, the nitty-gritty stuff. So, you know, it really depends on your family's priorities. For me, um, with my little girl, like it was very important to me that she – you know, she got used to sleeping in her cot early on. I just, that was something I, I wasn't a a huge one for doing lots of contact naps. And, um, you know, I was working when she was pretty young. So I just wanted that to have a bit of flexibility. So for me, like I started offering those naps in the cot from, from day one, we had some contact naps in there and I just found that she got a lot more used to that, you know, in the early days because of that reason. But if, you know, not all babies, like to sleep in their cot as much so even just starting with one nap a day often a nap in the middle of the day and offering that in their cot or bassinet is a really good place to start so the other ones you know head out for your pram walk or have a contact nap on the couch or something nice like that and just focus on one a day and once your baby's starting to get the hang of that then you could offer another one and build up from there around you know, around four months, so sort of 15, 16 weeks onwards is when you could start really looking at some self-settling skills. So people might have heard it called sleep training. I really, I'm not a huge fan of that term, but it's more having a bit of a plan and a bit of a, a range of settling methods you can look at to actually support your baby to feel comfortable with being in their cot awake and actually falling to sleep more independently. And there's so many ways to do that. And, you know, it doesn't have to involve them just screaming for prolonged periods of time because no one wants to leave their baby to cry for long periods of time. Mm. But, yeah, around four months is when you could really focus on the self-settling skills, getting a more of a set day routine happening. So, yeah, my the, the clients I work with one-to-one, that's from four months is when I start with that kind of support for yeah. that reason. Okay. And that's just because their their body systems have matured, those circadian rhythms are really kind of settled in. And yeah, the other thing that happens around four months is their sleep cycles mature. So they start to wake 
more fully at the end of a sleep cycle, which is about mm-hmm. 45 minutes long. So that's a naturally quite a good time when they're waking more fully in between sleep cycles, their sleep cycles are mature to actually work on supporting them to self-settle so they can link them together and have a longer nap. Mm, that's when the cat napping starts. Yeah, it's it's a very common time and people might have heard it called that four-month sleep progression. It's really, it's their sleep can change, but it's actually a developmental progression. So it's a normal developmental change and maturation of sleep cycles that's actually what's happening we, we often just hear about the negatives of it but it's really exciting it's such yeah. a, it's an exciting time because they they're moving towards potentially being able to sleep more independently if that's a goal that parents have it's a really good time to start working towards that yeah brilliant so good to have that time frame in the mind okay so we've talked about knowing about wake wake times we talked about the dark room what was the next thing we talked about we went on a bit of a tangent I know it's all good stuff though (laughs) we talked about sort of when when you could look at settling into a routine when you can work on sort of self-settling skills because I do I hear a lot of newborn parents wanting their baby to be able to self-settle in that first three months and it's you know some babies will some babies will seemingly just go to sleep very easily but it's just, it's a lot more realistic to start working on it closer to that four month mark. Yeah, yeah. That's great to know. Yeah. Okay. So, in terms of rocking and feeding to sleep, like you mentioned that first six, 12 weeks, this is exactly what they need. Would it be that four month mark when you might try those self settling strategies you talked about? Yeah. So um, all of those kind of things you just mentioned, so rocking to sleep, feeding to sleep, all of those things, uh, you might have heard them called sleep association. So that's literally just, it's something that your baby associates with going to sleep. And they're not bad habits. They are not negative. We hear so much about, about, you know, this negative kind of spin on it, and it's just not. They're not bad habits. If, If those things are working for you and your family, that is totally fine. But, you know, like quite commonly the families I work with, they get to a point where, you know, maybe that's not working so well for them anymore. Maybe their baby's just really not settling very well with that anymore and they're feeling really stuck about what to do next. So, yeah, moving away from – I actually just did a post on it yesterday, I think, comparing parent-dependent sleep associations with non-parent-dependent sleep associations. Can you tell us a few of those? Yeah, so parent dependent is basically something that your baby needs from you to get to sleep. So rocking, feeding, co-sleeping, those kind of things, even replacing a dummy if they're not independent with replacing that themselves. And then non-parent dependent is things like being in their sleeping bag, a dark room, white noise playing, a, a dummy if they're independent with using that, a comforter if, so from seven months, you can introduce a comforter. Those kind of things, they they don't need you to to come in and actually do for them. Obviously, you need to put them in their sleeping bag and darken the room. Yeah. But once that's all set up, they're, they're independent with those things. And they become really positive things that they associate with sleep. And when they wake after a sleep cycle, those things will all be present. And it means their sleep environment is a lot more familiar. Yeah, that's great. I distinctly remember breastfeeding to sleep and I I remember saying to my mum, I don't know how else I'm going to ever get her to sleep. Like I'm going to have to breastfeed her for the rest of her life. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. yeah. I just remember that distinct moment of thinking, what else can I do? Yeah, how do I I change this? So many parents that contact me, they're like, you haven't met my baby. Like, you you know, (laughs) you haven't met one like this, you know. (laughs) Like, you know, it doesn't matter what where you're at or what you're doing to get them to sleep, whether you're co-sleeping and feeding them 15 times a night, you know, you can always make changes and support them to to learn to settle in a different way. As impossible as it seems in that moment, you know, change is always possible. (laughs) Okay. That's good. So good to know. Oh my gosh, we could talk forever, couldn't we? (laughs) I've got another question for you. It's on that because we were talking about you know, how as a newborn, it's 
it's totally good to cuddle them to sleep and hold them and all the rest. What happens when we get our newborn to sleep? So I'm not talking about a four-month-old, but our newborn Mm. to sleep. And then as soon as we go to put them in the cot or the bassinet, they wake up. Yeah. This is a really common question that I get. (laughs) And basically what's happening there is if if you're getting fully assisting your baby to sleep in your arms in that newborn phase, as I said, it's totally fine. But what I'd suggest is wait until you're fairly certain they've been asleep for a good 10 or 15 minutes before you transfer them to their cot or bassinet. The reason for that is it takes them about 15 to 20 minutes to get into a deeper phase of sleep. So what's happening if you're getting them to sleep, they've been asleep for maybe five minutes and you transfer them and they wake, it's probably because they just weren't quite properly asleep yet. There's other things you can do to, to make for an easier transfer to the cot you know, putting their their legs and their bottom onto the mattress first and then slowly layering, laying them down rather than putting them down sort of just, you know, with their whole body touching the mattress oh. first or their head first. And Ooh, that's I all like to do with, tip. yeah, it's it's cool. It works well. And that's all to do with their, their newborn responses and that their sort of inbuilt reflexes. Yeah. So yeah. that startle reflex that, that you would have seen them do. Obviously, they're all swaddled and they can't startle, but they still get that feeling of, you know, that the position's changed. It's a bit more of a jolt if you put them all down together. So can I just clarify what you said? You sort of bend them at the hips a little bit and put their bottom down first, feet down second, and then their upper body. Yeah, so just literally kind of like sitting them a little bit and then like laying them down down slowly. Yeah, That's Um, a great tip. I didn't know that one. Yeah, it it works well. So if you combine that with just waiting until you're fairly certain they've been asleep for 10 or 15 minutes and then then transfer, it works well. The other thing I'd suggest is when you're transferring to the the bassinet or cot and you've done the sit down and they're in bed, just keep keep a little bit of gentle pressure with your hands on the top half of the body and the lower half just for a minute or two and then slowly take your hands away because it just helps kind of avoid that startle reflex because they've got that pressure there. They're not going to feel that they've kind of, they won't notice that they've moved out of your arms as much, if that makes sense. You kind of trick them into (laughs) not realising. It's just a slower transition, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I do just want to bring up, this is the pelvic floor physio and me, like I know as mums and women in this day and age, I I'm just going to say, I don't think we've ever been so busy as we are now and taking on more roles and responsibilities and all the rest. And that first six to 12 weeks, if you've got your baby sleeping on you and you're stuck there for the whole day, oh, not whole day, the whole sleep. Yeah. Like from a pelvic floor perspective, that's, and from a body healing perspective post birth, that's perfect. You know, you're getting almost forced rest. So don't feel guilty because you're actually helping to enhance your body's recovery by yep. resting when your baby's sleeping. I think that's I'm a huge advocate for it. And the same, like, yes to the contact naps because you can lay down and actually rest. You just put on some Netflix or whatever and just chill out. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's forced rest. And the other thing I like about, you know, your pram walks and car and stuff like that is that it gets you out of the house. You know, I used to head out, go get a coffee you know, go for a gentle walk and, you know, I, it just made me feel so much better. So that's something really common that families I work with, they want to to feel confident to get out of the house. Yeah. So even with babies that are older, I suggest doing the first nap assisted. I, I yep. just, I think it's an awesome thing to start the day like that. Okay. This is the physio and me talking again. I know this is not real life, but that's amazing. First nap, walk, you get your exercise in and done for the day. Yeah. Second nap. Obviously, sorry to interrupt. Obviously, mm. if you're still recovering, you might not feel you can walk for an hour because I know oh, totally. I had a seemingly like uncomplicated birth and I was just, it was, it was sore for a few weeks and I, the walks were short. But. Oh gosh. Yes. Yeah, totally. And that is a very valid point because if anyone's yeah. been listening to me for a while, they'll know in the first six weeks, I recommend I'm really conservative because I think recovery is so important five minutes of walking for that first week, 
10 minutes of walking for that second week. You could still do short bursts, but 10 minutes, then go have a little lie down, rest, whatever. Then 15 minutes, third week, 20 minutes, fourth week, 25 minutes, fifth week. So the, by, by the time you get up six weeks, that's 30 minutes. That's a decent amount of time because any longer you've just got that the gravitational forces on your already stretched and weakened pelvic floor and we just want to avoid any issues with incontinence and prolapse if we can and just help to mm. enhance recovery. So The other thing that contact naps are so good for is bonding and just connection, you know, even just mm. having your baby on you and soaking up their smell and yeah. just their warm little body. I, we had Hazel in the middle of winter and I loved it. Like yeah. even if she wasn't on me, just having her in a bassinet or in front of the fire. <laughs> I remember I watched like all the Harry Potters and I just loved it. <laughs> so oh, it's bringing back so many memories. I'm getting cocky oh. again. Can I have my fourth baby? <laughs> uh, do it. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, beautiful. And you'd be even busier. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's why those, those sleep times that, Enforced rest is so important. Yeah. Cool. Okay. We've talked about a lot of things. So we've really tried to hone in on those first six weeks. Is there anything that we, first six to 12 weeks, is there anything we haven't mentioned that you wanted to talk about? This episode is brought to you by Baby B, Australian owned and designed prams combining quality, safety, and style. Not only does Baby B let you try their prams at home with free returns for nine months, yes, that's nine months, they also offer an industry leading three year warranty for total peace of mind. With thousands of five star reviews, around-the-clock customer care, and up to $300 of free accessories with every pram. What are you waiting for? Go visit www.babybonline.com and check them out for yourself. And yes, for listeners of the podcast, there is a 20% discount code. Enter FITBEE, F-I-T-B-E-E 20 at checkout and T's and C's apply. Yeah, uh, what I'll do, I actually have a blog post on my top 10 newborn tips, so I can give you a link to that to share with your with your Facebook group. Because right. there's, yeah, we touched on most of those, but yeah, I think that that's, that's the nuts and bolts. I don't want to overwhelm people too much. But I think that the biggest thing is thinking about those awake times, not getting too, I know that people can get quite fixated on it and feel a bit anxious about the awake time sometimes it's just a guide and you use those awake awake windows in conjunction with looking at your baby you know are they showing you those tired signs have they had a nice full feed is it coming up to that 40 minutes to an hour if they're a younger baby sort of under four weeks and are they starting to maybe yawn are they starting to rub their face are they starting to suck on their hands you know, are they more jolty? Sometimes they can get a little bit jerky when they're getting tired. There's so many signs to look out for, but kind of learning to read your baby. Yeah. And I remember trying to do this. <laughs> it's not times. easy. <laughs> but I remember thinking I could have sworn that they had tired signs right from when they first wake up and they're just tired and they probably were tired. But yeah. what would you suggest then is if they're nowhere near their awake cycle but they're already tired yeah so um sometimes those tired signs can actually be very similar to hunger cues so I guess you know when they wake up um I like that basic feed play sleep pattern in the in the newborn phase so when they wake up offer offer a feed and then you know Generally, you know, for, for a lot of a lot of mums, a feed might take you know half an hour mm. or forty five minutes. So then you're pretty much already at that awake time anyway. But follow your baby's lead if they're if they're really sleepy and you know it's only been half an hour, that's okay. Particularly in that first four weeks, they have so many of your lovely maternal hormones and they are just sleepy. That's what I was saying when they get to sort of seven, eight weeks, really see them just like wake up. Parents talk about that quite a lot. They just like, it's just like they're a different baby. And that's because, as I said, those sleep hormones are wearing off. 
and their those circadian rhythms and all those kind of inbuilt hormones that they've got are starting to really take effect. So their cortisol, which is their natural kind of awake hormone, that's that's really kind of settling in. And their melatonin, which is their sleepy hormone, that's also settling in. And that's why offering sleep in a dark room is really important because melatonin is only secreted in the dark. So if they're sleeping in a light room, that melatonin production is actually blocked. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of looking at all of those things too. And with I love the, mel- the science. You can yeah. um, work in healthcare. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And with the melatonin production, is that a reason to get your baby outside if possible during the playtime? Yeah. So the other benefit of being out in, in the daylight and sunlight is that helps boost their serotonin production, which actually is very beneficial for sleep, like quality and quantity of sleep. That's the same for us as well. You know, if you've had a day at the beach outside all day, you're really tired that night and that's the, it's because of that. You've, you've been exposed to sunlight and fresh air all day. Your serotonin levels will be high and that really helps with quality and quantity of sleep. So obviously you're not going to have them outside all day, but even just having some small snippets of time where you're out, you know, and they're just exposed to some daylight really, really helps. Yeah, great. Mm. That's just so many good little tidbits of information there. <laughs> that just we've just dived into a lot in a short period. So thank you. To finish <laughs> off with, any final words of wisdom for I guess pregnant mums or mums in this newborn zero to twelve week stage? Yeah. Look, I think you know, just asking for help, being open and honest with your partner if you have one. You know, and if you don't, looking around you for your creating your village you might have heard of, even if that's a friend or a neighbour or, you know, aunties or or whoever's in your network, you know, having people to help you just prepare some meals for that initial kind of that first 12 weeks really because that's that's a really big time for you and for your baby. You're both figuring out how this is all going to work and that's regardless of whether you're a first time parent or a second or third or fourth. This is a new baby And if you're going from having one baby to having two or two to three, that's a huge change as well. So just be kind to yourself. And I think as well, you're getting your partner really involved and, you know, keeping the lines of communication really open because I do find so often that, you know, mums will be the primary person that's settling baby. Sometimes that can make parents feel really, mums feel quite, you know, quite stuck and like they can't get out or do much else like they can't get out easily to exercise or see their friends so starting that from the early days you know give your partner that chance to settle your baby and get confident with that and build those skills so that you both feel like you can do that because that's yeah it's quite a common goal that my one-to-one clients want to work on yeah is yeah both parents being able to settle baby Such a good goal and such a great, yeah, piece of advice. Great. Thank you, Jazz. Thank you so much. I will link the blog post where to find you. What's your Instagram handle for anyone listening? Yeah, it's let's double underscore sleep. Yep. Brilliant. Yeah. And I'll put it all in the show notes, but thank you so much for joining me today on this really important topic that I think can make a big difference to new, new parents' lives. So yeah, having that confidence absolutely. and that just ability to know what you can do and where to seek help is amazing. Yeah. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks. We'll touch base soon. Yeah, sounds good. And before I sign off, remember my team and I will be putting together with all the show notes for this episode, including all the links and how to connect with Jazz and that PDF checklist that she talked about. So head to fitnessmama.com forward slash podcast where all the information is. Have a fabulous day, everyone. And I look forward to you joining me next week for another episode of the Fitness Mama podcast. Thanks for listening to the Fitness Mama podcast brought to you by the Fitness Mama freebies found at www.fitnessmama.com forward slash free. 
So please take a few seconds to leave a review, subscribe so you don't miss an episode and be sure to take a screenshot of this podcast, upload it to your social media and tag me at Fitness Mama so I can give you a shout out too. Until next time, remember an active pregnancy, confident childbirth and strong postnatal recovery is something that you deserve. Remember our disclaimer, materials and contents in this podcast are intended as general information only and shouldn't substitute any medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. I'll see you soon.